I will now yield uh, to my friend and ranking member Sablan for his opening remarks. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding uh, today's hearing on H.R. 986, the Tribal Sovereignty Act, and I would also like to wish a good morning and a welcome to all of our witnesses today. The effect of this legislation would be to strip employees who work at businesses owned and operated by an Indian tribe and located on Indian lands of the protections afforded by the National Labor Relations Act. This bill deals with a dispute between the sovereign rights of Native American tribes and the rights of workers to organize and bargain collectively. However, this bill does not reconcile these competing interests, but rather strips hundreds of thousands of workers of their rights. I am a Chamorro, one of the indigenous people of the Mariana Islands, and fully appreciate the importance of tribal sovereignty for Native Americans. But I also believe deeply in workers' rights to organize, to collectively bargain, and to protect their right to fight for a safe workplace, fair pay, to provide a living for themselves and their families, and good benefits. To be fair, legislation and labor board decisions must balance these competing principles and not favor one at the expense of the other. And that is precisely what happened in the San Manuel Indian Bingo and Casino legislation, a decision where a Bush-era labor, labor board by a bipartisan three-to-one vote asserted jurisdiction over a tribal casino on tribal lands. Using a template widely accepted by the federal courts, the board stated it would exercise jurisdiction over commercial tribal enterprises unless doing so would, quote, touch exclusive rights of self-government in purely intramural matters or abrogate rights guaranteed by treaty. In the San Manuel decision, the board noted a distinction between commercial tribal enterprises that employ a substantial number of non-Indians and cater to a non-Indian clientele versus traditional tribal services or governmental functions. At least 75% of employees at tribal casinos are non-tribal members, and in some cases, as few as 1% of the employees are members of the tribe operating the casino. They have no say in the decision-making of tribal governments. There has been criticism of the San Manuel decision. However, the NLRB applied the same criteria as had been applied to other laws of general applicability, such as the Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, and many criminal statutes. For that reason, it is not surprising that multiple appeals courts have upheld San Manuel. Last year, the Supreme Court declined two petitions to overturn San Manuel. Federal labor law and tribal sovereignty can co comfortably coexist at tribal casinos without stripping workers of their rights under the National Labor Relations Act. As will be explained by a witness, some unions have consented to being governed by tribal labor relations ordinances because these tribes adopted a mutually agree agreeable labor ordinance that protects workers' rights to join a union and establishes a neutral dispute resolution panel. The important point being, however, is that if these tribal ordinances were amended in the future, these workers would still be protected by the NLRA. Tribal labor ordinances can be a workable option only if, one, they provide protections substantially equivalent to those afforded by the National Labor Relations Act, and two, the NLRA exists as a backstop. I want to thank the witnesses for taking the time to prepare their testimony and traveling to be here with us today. I also want to recognize one of the tribal casino workers, Mary Elizabeth Carter, who works at the Cache Creek Casino on Yolo, in Yolo County, California, and is a member of the UNITE here. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Sablan. Um, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I serve in another committee that also has oversight over Indian country, over Native Americans, Native Alaskans, Native Hawaiians, and the territories. And um, in this committee itself also, we recently had a hearing on the state of Indian schools 
BIE schools, and uh, I, I agree that you need all the money you can to upgrade uh, the education and the health service provide to your people. I don't disagree with that, but let me ask um, um, Mr. Gribbon, if I may, um, if HR 986 was enacted, um, are there any provisions that would prevent tribes from weakening or eliminating their existing labor laws? Uh, no. Um, however, there, there's, a, there's a couple of, of different issues here. One is, is that the existing uh, collective bargaining agreements um, are not throughout all of um, tribal casinos in California or across the country, nor are they um, in, in place in a variety of other industries, you know, like uh, mining and, you know, in, in some places. And without the NLRA, the, NL, the National Labor Relations Act, which would be exempted by this bill, H.R. 986, without that there, there there's, there's not the incentive to work out these tribal labor relations ordinances, in my view and in my experience. Um, and then again, some of these tribal labor relations ordinances, some of which have led to collective bargaining agreements that increase wages and benefits for workers, um, uh, that uh, have worked well in partnership with tribes that we, we work with, um, some of them are not. Uh, uh, adequate, like the one I mentioned from the Saginaw Chippewa tribe. Um, some of them, like the majority of them in California, are extremely weak. Um, ones that were negotiated in 1999 by the Gray Davis administration, then Governor Gray Davis, not one worker has organized so, so. Um, under those TLROs. Okay. So without it, um, there's, you know, without the NLRA, there, there, there isn't the continued ability to be able to improve TLROs, and moreover, every time there's a new governor, you you know, it depends on who the new he sh governor, he or she is, what kind of position they're going to take with respect to that part of the compact. So, so without the National Labor Relations Act, there is really uh, no backstop of protection for workers, is what you're saying? It's an absolute foundation. Okay. Let me ask um, uh, some of the witnesses, if I could just get a yes or no answer, uh, I'd appreciate it. Um, are you, the, those witnesses who are here to support the, the bill uh, and in the hearing, are you saying that the sovereignty of, of Indian countries, that the National Labor Relations Act should not apply because of the sovereignty? Is that a, an across the board or is that just for your tribe, for your individual tribes? Yes, across the board or just for your tribe? Yes to which one? To just your tribe, or do you speak for all Native Americans? The National Congress of American Indians advocates for 567 tribal nations, and uh, we have three conferences a year, and at those conferences, okay. we have an opportunity to pass resolutions, and one of the resolutions that was passed unanimously, and we're a consensus organization, was to uh, support this legislation. So that's where our marching Be orders come from. Because you as a tribe are sovereign. Yes. Okay, so why is it that there are tribes with casinos who go through great length and extent to deny tribes without casinos a license? Aren't they also as sovereign as tribes that are you represent? Today? Deny a license? Deny a casino license. They, they come to Congress and lobby. Are, is it, aren't, aren't they as sovereign as each one of you here? Yes. Then why don't, why do you, they lobby Congress to deny them a casino license? Why can't they get the same thing that you have? Yeah, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yes, Congressman. I'm sure some of may, you. May I try to answer yes, that for please. you? Please. Uh, I don't have much time, but please. Um, In fact, it all depends on the situation. In California, if they're trying to, to offer reservation gaming, then I can see why other tribes would try to stop them from getting licensure, because that's not what's in the compact or what's in the, what the state voted for, the people of California voted for. And as for the, this HR 986, I cannot speak 
for any other tribe in the United States other than my own. But if I was able to, I would say yes, but it is a yes for my tribe. I, I thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, th I thank the gentleman's time has expired. Now it's uh, my privilege to uh, recognize the ranking member, Mr. Sablon, for your closing remarks. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, I, I want to thank all the witnesses um, today for their testimony. I'm not trying to stick my nose into your business, sir, but, uh, but um, as I noted at the outset, the San Manuel decision struck a balance between the protection of tribal sovereignty rights and the protection of workers' rights. And although tribal labor ordinances have been adopted by some tribes, these ordinances vary greatly in their levels of workforce protection. I have uh, Section 3107 uh, of the uh, 2010 Blackfoot Tribal Employment Rights Ordinance and Safety Enforcement Act of 2010, which I asked to insert in the record. Um, says, reads this, unions are prohibited in the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. So there are levels of, uh, there are tribes that discourage unions in their organizations. Without objection, it will be under. Yeah. And so, um, again, although tribal, um, where was I? Jeez. So um, there is no uniform minimum standard for tribal ordinances, uh, which means there could be 567 different labor standards depending on the tribe. What provides a floor for protection is the National Labor Relations Act. However, if H.R. 986 were enacted, workers would lose the protection of a federal minimum standard. Similar concerns were raised by the International Labor Organization in a letter to Congress regarding the Tribal Labor Sovereignty Act of 2015. ILO wrote in part, in those cases where there are no tribal labor relations ordinances, undue restrictions on collective bargaining, excessive limitation on freedom of association rights, or lack of protection from unfair labor practices, workers on tribal territories would be left without any remedy for violation of their fundamental freedom of association rights short of a constitutional battle. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent also to include uh, this three-page letter from the International Labor Organization in the record of this hearing. Without objection, Thank it will you, be sir. And I would also ask for unanimous consent to include the letters of opposition from the AFL-CIO, International Union of Operating Engineers, United Auto Workers Local 2121, and the United Steel Workers into the record. Without objection, they'll be entered. And as we have learned today, Indian tribes are subject to a number of federal employment laws, including the Fair Labor Standards Act, OSHA, ERISA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, um, but, um, Mr. Klabuski, uh, in your question, your response to the ranking member's question, if Title VII of the Civil Rights Act applied to the tribes, you answered yes. The answer is no. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act doesn't apply to Indian tribes, but it does to any local government. Thank you for that correction, sir. You're welcome, sir. Uh, a review of the, in of the committee's activities may help explain the focus. Since the majority took control in 2011, there has been 26 hearings or markups attacking the National Labor Relations Board rules and decisions, compared with 17 on the job training and technical education, 11 on OSHA and mine safety, 15 on pensions and retirement issues, and 11 on wage and hour issues. What we know is that only 6.4% of the private sector workforce today is covered by a union agreement. Union agreements have provided many low-wage service workers employed in tribal casinos or other tribal businesses with improved wages and benefits, which has provided them with a foothold to the middle class. By negotiating, employer provided health care, the cost to state and local government to assist with health care costs have gone down. Legislation in this area needs to balance the sovereign rights of Native American tribes with the rights of workers to organize and bargain collectively. Mr. Chairman, we should not be enacting legislation that weakens workers' ability to bargain for a fair share of the wealth, whether it is in a commercial business or a tribal enterprise. And if I may, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, that I ran for Congress was to find a way to help improve the education of the poor people that I represent, the Northern Mariana Islands. 
And in seven years working on that, and I was finally happy that uh, with the help of Mr. Klein and Mr. Scott, and I think Mr. Okita was also ranking at that time, but we were able to increase the formula for, for the insular areas for Title I money. And then I saw that we had that hearing and I saw the appalling state of Indian, Indian schools. So I was able to also, working with Mr. Klein, increase the funding for Bureau of Indian Education money. Because you guys need to speak up for your people. Their education, those are children, sir, and the appalling state of the education conduct, run by the Department of Interior is not something that I can say I'm proud of to be an American. And uh, so uh, saying that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman and uh, thank you especially as you come from a perspective of actually being a tribal member and uh, appreciate your, your passion and your concern.